Well, that worked. Welcome to the Undeserved Flavor. Take 9,872.4. This little clicker button here is my start stop. But for some reason, instead of starting or stopping the video, it just flips the camera around. Because I'm, you know, recording using a phone. <sighs> uh, well, in the process of retaking this video about 9,000 times, I've thought, you know what, maybe for my few followers that would like to see bloopers, I should start a Patreon account. You know how that, it's like some YouTubers, like they do Patreon, uh, where like you can try and get your regular, regular viewers, regular subscribers to like pay you a, a subscription for seeing bonus video and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm not gonna do that. But I just thought that was kind of funny, or it, that was a funny potential possible thought because I have so many outtakes and bloopers and that being like inside of those, there's so much time. I've talked already for upwards of, well, cumulatively close to an hour and basically just stopped the video because I didn't actually get to what I wanted to talk about because I just talk and talk and ramble and all of a sudden get distracted and uh, you know, like, for example, oh my gosh, I'm about to step in some mud and my shoes don't want to get muddy and talk about the quality of the video that I'm recording in and yada, yada, yada. Should I delete this one and start over? No, I'm going to keep going. What do I want to talk about today on the Undeserved Flavor, where we taste and see that the Lord is good? I watched a video in which I saw a comment. Somebody commented about an early church father, and I thought this was kind of cool because I often refer to the early church fathers um, for people that are arguing about, you know, well, the early church wasn't universalist. And I say, it was universalist. Well, I always say, well, we'll go read the early church fathers. And then you get the religious scholars, not always scholars, they're just people that have actually done some studying of the early church, but they're still dogmatic in what they believe. So they study the early church, they study scriptures, they study the ancient text through the lens of their dogma. So they see what they want to see. Sound familiar? That's pretty much church as we know it. You read the Bible in order to support what you believe, not tell you what to believe, not open you up to something new. Anyway, the intent behind this video is ultimately just, I want to share with you a comment that I made on this other person's comment which is pretty... I'm not gonna pat myself on my back here, but it kind of goes in line with the, the purpose behind this channel. And that is, I want you to think for yourself. Don't take what I say as gospel, even though I say it's gospel. Don't take what I say as anything factual. Think for yourself. Everybody should be thinking for themselves. Nobody should be just, like, one of my pet peeves is manipulation. I, as you can tell, if you've been following my channel and seeing any of the comments, you know, there's a certain individual who continues to engage with uh, fear and manipulation in a really twisted and sick um, Protestant fundamentalist view of the scriptures. And it's manipulation. You're using mistranslated texts to manipulate people with fear. Well, it's ultimately just fear, but there's a lot of things that go into it. You're playing on people's emotions and you're exploiting people who may be emotionally delicate 
or sensitive, such as children. Like, think of all the little Baptist boys and girls that went to camp and, you know, their little camp counselor sat them around the campfire. I hope it's not too windy for my speakers or microphone here. And these kids heard about the torment that's to come if they don't follow the formula, the proper formula of believing in Jesus and all that comes along with that, according to the Baptist, fundamentalist, whatever stream of dogma that they're told to follow. A lot of people grow up traumatized. I mean, like the nightmares and like, there's your torment. It's, it's, it's thinking that you might end up frying in your own fat. And you all know I love using that terminology. Because that's what it is. You're frying your own fat. Well, what about those people who don't want to be with God for all eternity? Do you think they're going to want to fry in their own fat? Do you think they're going to want to jump in a vat of boiling oil? Or jump into a pile of burning coals and just sit there and fry in their own fat for eternity. The level of utter incoherence and idiocy that comes with the vast majority of Western Christian dogma, like, often leaves me speechless. Like, I want to do videos and stuff, and, and like, that's one of the reasons why I do so many outtakes and I stop the video and because I ramble and ramble because I'm like, I'm trying to round out what I want to say in this video because of how stupid the thing I'm trying to address actually is. Like, with... People don't think. You need to think for yourself. What is the mind of Christ? Okay, in the beginning was the Logos. And the Logos was with God. The Logos was God. And the Logos became flesh. Oh, okay. What is Logos? Why is the word that should be translated logic, reasoning, thinking, creativity. Why do we translate that word to word? Oh, I know why. Because the pagan Manichaeists refused to learn the language of the original texts. And they had an agenda they were power hungry, greedy, political, all of the above. Anyway, we're still reaping the benefits of that trash 2,000 years later. Well, actually, it was like 16, 1800 years ago when all that stuff started. But that said, the point of this video, as we're now darn near 10 minutes in, I wanted to comment on a comment on another video. It was real simple, but ultimately it points to what we should all be doing if we're honest truth seekers, and that is think for yourself. Well, here's the thing. Somebody pointed out a uh, comment of an early church father, which is something I often, I always, I often do. I appeal to the early church fathers when I say the early church was Christian universalist, but then you get somebody like well, what about this early church father? Ignatius. And then he goes on to uh, type out this long quote from Ignatius in which talks about how a certain group of people will be going into an unquenchable fire. And then someone else comments and says, well, we don't know the lens through which Ignatius, you know, was uh, articulating his thought when he said the term inquenchable fire. And then that commenter said, well, right, we don't know the lens, so how are we to know? 
And I'm like, we do know which lens. It's pretty clear. If he meant it to mean, quote unquote, eternal, then he would have used a word that literally means eternal. But he didn't. If you want to go back to the ancient Greek, <clears throat> excuse me. If you want to go back to the ancient, ancient Greek, they have a word that literally means eternal, but they didn't use it. You know what they used? They used the word that means ages or age or a uh, period of time with parameters. Okay, so in using the word, un, or in, in using the phrase unquenchable fire, define unquenchable. Well, that doesn't mean eternal. It means it's not going to be put out until it's done doing what it's supposed to do. That means it can't be interrupted. It will accomplish that which it's meant to accomplish. No, somebody can't run up to God with a fire extinguisher and put out the consuming fire that is God. Nobody's going to argue with that if you're a Christian or, I mean, like, any, any, anybody that believes God is a consuming fire, as the Bible says he is, would agree with that. It doesn't matter what your eschatology is. Nobody can ex extinguish or quench the consuming fire of God. That has nothing to do with the duration or the time in which this fire lasts. Okay, obviously we know God lasts forever, but the unquenchability of this fire in the context in which Ignatius wrote it has nothing to do with time. It has to do with the job at hand. What is he talking about? He's talking about purification. Something needs to be burned up. There's no such thing in our existence as a fire that does not burn up eventually or go out eventually with the exception of one example in the Bible. The burning bush. Well, wait a minute. Is that bush still burning? On Mount Sinai? It's actually not. It's out. It's gone. But, what wasn't happening to that bush while the bush, the bush of God was burning? The bush was not being consumed. Okay. This video's already gone way off track. And now there's a helicopter. Hello. Hurry up and get out of here. So the point I'm trying to make is, we know the lens Ignatius was, was looking through when he said unquenchable fire. He was talking about a fire that had a purpose. It had nothing to do with eternity. Let me just read what I said. We know which lens. It's clear. If he meant it to mean eternal, then he would have used a word that means eternal. He would not have left any ambiguity on such an important matter. Also, we see clearly that the Latin translators intentionally changed the context of many passages, especially those in reference to the afterlife, i.e. translating something with parameters like quote-unquote ages to quote-unquote eternity, something without limits, when this was not necessary. They were not confused. Ion did not mean eternity in the first century. It meant an age. It did, however, evolve to fit that meaning in the following centuries. Why? Because political elitists and religious power-hungry pawns like Augustine bent the texts to fit their agenda. The effects of Rome's takeover 
of the quote unquote way continue to this day. Need I say more? Appreciate y'all hanging out. If you're not subscribed, hit that subscribe button. I got another one coming that's gonna be a lot more to the point and more substantive. I know some of my videos may be uh, just me rambling, but uh, I hope you get some nuggets out of what I do here. My point and, and goal and passion is to get you thinking for yourself. It's not hard to do. I mean, like, just think for yourself. I'm not, I like, I, I, I'll argue with you in the comment section if you don't agree with me. I uh, don't get offended if you want to call me a bunch of names. I actually find it kind of challenging to not get in the comments and just name call you right back because it's, fun but it's too easy it's too easy to just when you call me all kinds of things like liar and whatever I've been called some things it's too easy for me to just get back and just play your dumb game but what's not as easy is the golden rule what's the golden rule Bobby, <laughs> are you still watching my videos, Bob? What's the golden rule? Can you please, don't just put, give me the verse. Don't just give me the verse. <sighs> quote it, the whole thing. Pick your favorite translation and quote the golden rule. Mr. Bobby. Anyway, hope y'all have a great day. I have another pile of videos coming um, like I said before well actually I don't know if I said it in this video but uh, yeah this is like take 9857 or something um, I have a pile of video topics that I want to talk about and I'd like to offer y'all a daily dose of Christian Universalist based Jibber jabber. Chit chat. Thoughts for chewing on. And I know it's uh, not really going to be that valuable to a lot of people, especially the academics and the scholars, but that's not who I'm appealing to. We have a community out here that, it, honestly, it's really a, kind of a lonely life to be on this journey of seeking truth. We don't fit in at churches in America or even, well, really anywhere. Um, we, we try, you know, there's the Unitarian Universalist or there's the Eastern Orthodox. And it's just like, well, the Unitarian Universalist isn't a religion. Well, I guess it is by definition, but it's agnostic. It's not Christian. All it really is is fundamentally uh, political activist, progressive social justice group. Like, they, they, they will admit to you they don't really have a stance on the afterlife or a personification of a god. They're more or less just uh, a voice for the, uh, the minorities, whatever the minority may be that day, whether it's homosexuals or colored people or whatever the minority is of that day. I'm sorry, I said colored people. I, like obviously that's a that's not today's term but you know think about it like pick pick your flavor of minority you know that's what I mean it is like pick your flavor of minority that's the they're gonna find a reason to you know be a voice for a minority and that's fine it's good it's great it's just a little weird that they're dressing up like Catholic priests and calling themselves a a religion and doing ceremonial liturgical services it's like that's uh, you're uh 
kind of erring on the side of being a cult, if you ask me. A cult with a political agenda. But uh, anyway, more power to you. You're doing good work. You have a good heart. You're doing good things. And uh, be careful that you don't fry in your own fat for all eternity because, you know, that's what the Baptists are going to tell you along with a lot of other Western Christians. But yeah, back to what I was saying about us. Uh, this is kind of a lonely journey for those of us who have uh, tasted of the light. Let me know what you think in the comments. I'm not going to ramble on forever. I got something else to talk about. I'm going to put in a future video. Um, taste and see that the Lord is good. He's better than we've ever been taught. 